From ages past no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Do you remember what it was like when you were a child? How time seemed to pass so slowly. They say that the older you get, the more time seems to speed up. But I remember that as a kid, I felt like half my life was just spent waiting. You know, waiting for my dad to get home. Waiting until Christmas, and I remember my family's advent calendar to track the days. Waiting until I was older and I could get a job and have money. Waiting until I could have my driver's license. And then, of course, there were the long car rides with the nostalgic refrain, are we there yet? Uh, at that age, the most annoying piece of advice I could get from adults was always hurry up and wait. Uh, I always hated it when people would say that. And yet, this is precisely the message of our Advent season, which we begin today. As we start a new year in the church calendar, we are required to hold off on Christmas carols, to say Happy Advent instead of Merry Christmas, and to spend four Sundays anticipating Christmas, but not yet celebrating it. So here, right off the bat for the new church year, we are instructed in our liturgy to hurry up and wait. Why? What is the advantage to this anticipation, this expectation, this longing? If Christ has come already, then why do we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel? If Christ has dropped down from heaven to lay in Bethlehem's manger, then why do we sing, drop down ye heavens from above? And if we've been forgiven by his cross, then why do we take the time to acknowledge our sins and to repent? That's why I want to explore with you this morning why we are called to be a people of expectation. For we hear this morning from the prophet Isaiah a promise of God to his people that the Lord works for those who, wa who wait for him. He works for those who wait for him. I know that the holiday season can be a difficult time for many of us. You know, some of you have lost loved ones in the past year and this will be your first Christmas without them. Some of you perhaps have family that's distant maybe geographically or emotionally, and so your Christmas celebration isn't going to look like what you'd hope it would. Or maybe you're just dealing with some stuff right now, so it's hard to get into the Christmas spirit. At this time of year, we sometimes realize that things are not all as they should be, and that life isn't really the Hallmark card that we wish it were. Our texts this morning are real with this fact, and in fact, they take things one step farther. Not only is the brokenness of the world evident around us, in our relationships and the mortality which is claimed those who we love. But the brokenness of the world is also within us in the sins which so easily entangle us. We ourselves are not as we should be. And so the prophet Isaiah in our Old Testament lesson this morning gives voice to this, not only in that lesson but also in the Advent prose which we heard at the start of the service, a collection of verses from the prophet Isaiah. He says, Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. This is his plea. He acknowledges that because of our sins, we've become like this holy city that has become a wilderness. A holy and a beautiful house that has become a desolation. And likewise, he compares us to leaves that are falling away. You know, I was back in Baltimore for Thanksgiving, and I was really struck by the fall leaves, which I haven't seen <laughs> down here. You know, it's nice to be in a place with the four seasons. Well, Isaiah tells us that we're like those trees, withering away, dying, and easily blown away by the wind. This is what our sins have done to us. He says, we have sinned and are as an unclean thing, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So we hear these passages about our sinfulness, and we heard in the exhortation this morning that we must have penitent hearts. We must judge ourselves and acknowledge our sins before Almighty God in order to prepare ourselves to receive him. And that's why we deck the altar in purple. And we bump the confession up to the beginning of this service to get real with the fact that we have a need for change. In the beautiful hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, we cry out with the voice of Israel in exile, comparing ourselves to God's people in a foreign land under the oppression of their enemies. We make their song our own because we find ourselves in a foreign land. We were designed for Eden, and yet we've been disqualified and cast out. We were designed for heaven, and yet we inhabit this world, the veil of tears and sorrow, as we say in the prayer. So just as Israel was oppressed by their captors and enslaved in Egypt, and then by Assyria and Babylon, 
So we're oppressed by our sins and held captive by them. So when we sing in the hymn about captive Israel, mourning in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear, we're referring to ourselves, held captive by our sins and the death which is their effect in our exile here in the world. So we're crying out to God in the spirit of the Old Testament um, people of Israel that he would return and save us. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them the bowls of tears to drink. So our psalmist, in these words, cries out from this place of exile. And yet he sings as one who's not without hope. He looks ahead to the coming of the Messiah, saying, Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made so strong for yourself. And so we will never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. So he's looking towards this time when we would be restored, when the Lord would show the light of his countenance upon us, and we would be saved. This is our Christian hope. During this season, we not only sit with the reality of where we are, but are also anticipating the joy of where we will someday be when Christ returns and all that is wrong is made right. This season of Advent, which means arrival, has us living in between these two comings of Christ. He came 2,000 years ago in great humility to visit us, and he will come again in glorious majesty to be our judge and to raise us up to the life immortal. So this is the promise of Christ to us this Advent, that he will not leave us here, but he will come again as an event in human history. He tells us that the Son of Man will come in clouds and with great power and glory. He tells us to remember this, to keep this hope alive within us, and so he commands us to stay awake. He says, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. And later he tells us, it's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to keep watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. So serious is Christ about this promise of his return that he wants us to be spiritually alert, prepared for him. He wants us to be like this doorkeeper who's eagerly watching, like the maidens of that hymn that we just sang, with lamps prepared to hasten to the summons, clothed in our wedding garments in order to share in the wedding feast. For on that day, when Christ returns, he'll come to separate the sheep from the goats. He'll confirm the righteous and virtuous that there will be no more sin. The devil will be vanquished, and these mortal bodies will put on immortality. And his kingdom will be established in the world. So we cry out in the hymn, Savior, take the power and glory. Claim the kingdom for thine own. Thou shalt reign, and thou alone. On that day, the dead will be raised, and we'll be able to celebrate our holiday with those whom we love, who are no longer with us. And on that day when sin is conquered, there will be no more brokenness, no more conflict, but only love and joy and peace. And on that day, though we find ourselves here eating the bread of tears and drinking bowls of tears to drink, on that day the tears shall be wiped away from every eye. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. This is the message of our God in the last two verses of that Advent prose which we heard. Whereas we told him in the first two verses about our sinfulness and our sufferings, he tells us in the last two verses about his mercy and his salvation. We call ourselves in that hymn sinners, but he calls us witnesses. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know me and believe me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. My salvation shall not tarry. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. Fear not, for I will save thee. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Redeemer. So this hymn takes us on this beautiful Advent journey from sin to servanthood, from wickedness to being witnesses, and from exile to emancipation. And during this season of Advent, what we're doing is inhabiting that in-between time. There's much that's already, and there's much that's not yet. Christ has come, but it remains for him to come again. The warning shot has been fired into hell. We're not yet done being the church militant. And our citizenship is in heaven, 
although our day-to-day -day is spent here in exile. In our bondage, we make it our prayer, drop down ye heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. In other words, come Lord Jesus, tear open the heavens and come down. Let heaven come down to the earth like rain, and come again to be our judge and our redeemer. During this season, this is our prayer, as we are told to hurry up and wait. But we're comforted with the message that the Lord is working for those who wait for him. For of that day and the hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware therefore and keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. For the Lord tells us this day, in the midst of our waiting, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, my salvation shall not tarry. To him be all honor and glory both now and forever. May our Lord come quickly. Amen. Amen.